All right. Chapter 13, Monopolistic Competition and Oligopoly. So most firms fall um, in this market structure, um, more so monopolistic competition. So we did, you know, one extreme, which is pure competition, then the other extreme, which is pure monopoly. But most industries fall in the middle, which would be monopolistic competition and oligopoly. Okay, so the characteristics of monopolistic competition is that there are a relatively large number of sellers. Unlike a monopolist, which is just one seller, or pure competition, which is thousands of sellers, you know, this could be 20, 50, 60, 80 firms, for example, and the goods they are selling are differentiated. So, for example, when you go out to buy shoes, you can find many different types of shoes, um, and they have, you know, different characteristics and styles. Restaurants also differentiate their food. A, a burger at one place is not exactly the same burger at another place. Computers are differentiated and so on. And firms in this market structure have ease of entry and exit in the long run, very similar to pure competition. They might have a little more of a barrier to entry because of the cost for a firm to enter um, is higher because of the research and development required to differentiate the product. But overall, it is pretty easy to enter and exit. And because of product differentiation, they also are characterized by non-price competition uh, because of advertising. You know, they want to advertise that their product is better than the other guy because it has this and this and this attribute that the other guy doesn't. Also, just as a side note, that the monopolistically competitive firm does have um, some control over price, over the price. Since the good is differentiated, then they can charge a different price for their good. Um, and a purely competitive market structure, since all the goods are the same, you know, the firm is a price taker. You know, if they were to charge a higher price, they would get no business because all the rival firms produce the exact same good, for example. However, um, in a monopolistically competitive market structure, you know, they have some control over price, but not enough where it would influence their rival's pricing structure because there are so many substitutes out there that, you know, one firm lowering their price wouldn't necessarily spark their other 50 firms to also lower their price. Okay, we're going to look at the fir four firm concentration ratio and the Herfindahl index. And this will help tell us if the industry is monopolistically competitive. Uh, so first we look at the four firm concentration ratio and it's the percentage of sales by four largest firms. So the output of the four largest firms divided by the total output in the whole industry. So for a pure monopolist, this would be one or, you know, if we look at percentage, it'd be 100% because they are the um, only firm providing that good. So their output that they produce would be the total output in the industry. Okay. Usually in industries where the four form concentration ratio is 40% or less, they are monopolistically competitive. And in industries where it, the market structure is more of an oligopoly, then the four form concentration ratio is higher, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. Um, now, we also look at the Herfindahl index because what the four form concentration ratio doesn't tell us is how much market power each firm has. So it could be the output of the four largest firms. Let's say, you know, they produce a thousand units altogether. But, you know, one of the firms produces 800 of those 1,000 units. So the Herfindahl Index will give greater weight to firms who have a larger percentage of market share. Now, industries that tend towards more in a purely competitive market structure will have a very low Herfindahl Index because each 
firm is small and they're a price taker. I mean, in industries where it tends more towards oligopoly or monopoly structure, the Herfindahl Index would be very, very high. So the index varies anywhere from zero, which would be uh, indicate a pure, purely competitive market structure, or to 10,000, which would indicate a pure monopoly. So the lower the index is, the more competitive the industry is, and the higher the index is, the less competitive the industry is. Okay, looking at this table, okay, we can see that in the textile machinery industry, the four firm concentration ratio is 30. So the largest four firms in the textile machinery industry produce 30% or account for 30% of all the sales, and the Herfindahl index is 360. Okay, and if we look at the other extreme here, the bolts, nuts, and rivets industry, the largest four firms produce only 4% of the total output, and the Herfindahl index is 6%, indicating that um, no one firm has a large percentage of the market share. So the bolts, nuts, and rivets industry tends more towards pure competition mark or purely competitive market structure. Whereas the textile machinery industry is tends more towards a monopolistically competitive market structure. So other market structures here that are monopolistically competitive, you know, for example, women's dresses, textile bags, plastic bags, etc. For a firm in a monopolistically competitive market structure, their demand is highly elastic. Um, it's because there are, it faces competition from other firms. The product is differentiated, um, but it's also similar to other firms. So in a purely competitive market structure, the demand curve is horizontal. It's purely elastic because the other firms are producing an identical good, so it's a perfect substitute for each other. However, um, in a monopolistically competitive market structure, the goods are differentiated. So the demand curve is not purely elastic, but it is highly elastic since there are closer substitutes available. Other factors affecting the elasticity of the demand curve would be um, the degree of product differentiation. Uh, a firm that that is able to differentiate their product much more than their rivals will have lower elasticity than firms that hardly differentiate their product from other firms. And also the number of rivals. You know, if there's 30 firms producing similar products, um, elasticity will be lower than if there were 60 firms producing that same or a similar product. Key point, the less number of rival firms and the less product differentiation, the more elastic the demand curve will be for a firm in a monopolistically competitive market structure. And just like a monopolist or a firm in a purely competitive market structure, okay, the firm in a monopolistically competitive market structure will produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. This is true for the three market structures of the firm, purely competitive firm, 
the monopolist and the monopolistically competitive firm. Okay. And in the short run, a monopolistically competitive firm can earn a profit or a loss just like a firm that is in pure competition. And in the long run, they only earn a normal profit, meaning um, an accounting profit, economic profit would be zero, and there is ease of entry and exit. Okay, so let's look at a monopolistically competitive firm that is earning an economic profit in the short run. Okay, so we'll draw a marginal cost curve here, and then we need to add in our average total cost. Okay, so just like the monopolist, the monopolistically competitive firm in the short run, okay, will decide its profit maximizing quantity by producing or marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay. And then they will trace this up to the demand curve and then all the way to the left and this will be their profit maximizing price over here okay so since their price per unit that they are earning is higher than the average total cost per unit over here then the difference as you can see is the economic profit over here if potential entrants see that these firms are earning an economic profit in the short run, then they will usually try to enter the industry in the long run. Okay. This is an example of a monopolistically competitive firm um, that has a loss in the short run. Okay. So we're going to, again, draw our marginal cost curve. And then our average total cost. Okay. So again, in this case, this firm is going to want to minimize its loss. So it's going to produce where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. That's the loss minimizing output. Okay. And the loss minimizing price will follow this up until it hits the demand curve. Okay, this will be the price over here. And so this is what they earn per unit, which is unfortunately lower than the average total cost per unit. And so in the end, the firm can only minimize its loss. And then in the long run, it would exit the industry. Okay, and in the long run, the monopolistically competitive firm earns a normal profit, meaning zero economic profit, but accounting profit is positive. Okay, so we have our marginal cost curve over here. Our average total cost. Okay, so again, profit maximizing output is determined by where marginal revenue intersects marginal cost. Profit maximizing price, we hit the demand curve, go to the left, and here we see that the profit maximizing price per output equals the average total cost per output. So right here, there's only a normal profit earned. So the monopolistically competitive firm is inefficient, meaning that they are not achieving productive or allocative efficiency. Um, productive efficiency, because the price is greater than minimum average total cost. The purely competitive firm is at productive e efficiency because they are producing where price equals the minimum average total cost. So the price per unit they're earning e is equal to the minimum average total cost per unit. But in this case, since the price is greater than the minimum average total cost, um, costs are not being fully minimized here. 
And then allocative efficiency is occurring because price is greater than marginal cost. So in this case, total surplus is not being maximized. Um, surplus would be maximized if price equals marginal revenue equals marginal cost, just like in a purely competitive firm. Okay, and since price is greater than this, they are not producing at the output that would minimize total surplus. And because of that as well, then they have excess capacity, meaning they have equipment and also plant room that are being underused since the firms are producing less than the minimum average total cost output. Okay, so we see here that if they were producing at Q4, okay, then there would be no excess capacity, but since they're looking to maximize profit, they're producing at Q3. And so right here, since production is less than it would be if they were producing where price equals minimum average total cost, then they have plant equipment that is being underused. Also, because price is greater than the minimum average total cost, minimum average total cost would be here, okay, but they are charging a price that's above average total cost, you know, there's a loss of, again, allocative efficiency and productive efficiency as well. Okay, so there's an incentive for the monopolistically competitive firm um, to earn an economic profit even in the long run. And you know, they can do this by differentiating the product more than their rivals and also by giving it superior attributes and qualities and also by engaging in more and better quality advertising. And then consumers benefit from this because, well, consumers do like to have options and choices. And so, so even though the price may not be as low as it would be in a, in a if in a purely competitive market structure, um, consumers can be better off regardless because we benefit from having more choices, different brands and different levels of quality as well. Okay, and now we look at oligopoly where there's a few large producers and then the four firm concentration ratio in this case would be over 40%. A lot of times you might hear something referred to as like the big four, the big five, and usually, you know, right there, that's a giveaway that the industry is an oligopolistic structure. And homogeneous oligopoly, they, you know, it's a few firms that are producing the same goods. So they're all producing, let's say like aluminum or copper or steel. And differential oligopoly is when it's a few firms producing a similar but differentiated product. So such as household appliances, um, different types of computers, uh, breakfast cereals, etc. Uh, the auto industry also is a differentiated oligopoly. And so the firms in, in an oligopolistic structure do have control over price, but it's interdependent with their rivals and this is where it can get a little tricky and where it discusses in a few slides but you know if one firm lowers their price then other firms tend to follow that price cut or if a firm increases their price then other firms might follow or keep it low to try to capture more sales from its rival a firm in a monopolistically competitive structure, you know, they have some control over price, but their price changes don't really affect the sales of the rival firms because there are so many of them. But a firm in an oligopolistic structure, a price change would affect the sales of their rivals since there's so few firms in that industry. There are entry to barriers for various reasons. Um, one of them could be that these 
few firms in this structure have an ownership of a resource. So for example, um, the gold industry is an oligopoly, is the silver industry, etc. because so few firms, just a few firms, um, own the resource. Also, it could be because of patents. You know, the pharmaceutical industries, um, patents have become a an barrier to entry. And also, it could be that um, a few firms can service the entire market um, and achieve economies of scale. And um, a new firm coming in, you know, would have high startup costs. So, for example, let's say it's a new um, competitor in the airline industry. You know, the startup costs for an airline industry are not necessarily low. You know, the acquisition of jets, the hiring of personnel, etc. These are huge costs. And if there's not enough demand for that product, then economies of scale will not be achieved and that firm will be driven out of the market. So usually there's high cost of entry involved. And some industries have become oligopolistic uh, through mergers. And this is when, you know, two or more firms merge together to become one firm. And so that leaves less firms in that industry. And these firms have a little bit more, quote unquote, monopoly power. You know, they have greater control over market supply and also price as well. Sometimes the government um, blocks these mergers um, to prevent these so few firms from having too much power and um, limiting product variation, you know, inhibiting competition and having very high prices for consumers. But other times they don't and they allow it. Some firms over the years that have experienced plenty of mergers have been uh, the banking industry and then the airline industry. Okay, as mentioned earlier, you know, it, an industry is defined as oligopolistic if the four firm concentration ratio is 40% or more. However, there are some shortcomings with this ratio. Um, one of the shortcomings is that it does not show a localized market. So, so an industry may technically be a monopolistically competitive industry uh, because the four firm concentration ratio is 40 is less than 40 percent however depending on you know the market like in a local market it might just be two firms servicing that whole market and therefore that market itself the industry has an oligopolistic structure over there so it doesn't show that also it doesn't show when um, firms compete in different industries so for example um, the copper industry competes with the aluminum industry because both these resources are used for many applications such as power lines. And so, you know, the concentration ratio shows to be higher than it really is because it's only, it's assuming that they're competing in just one industry. So for example, firms in copper industries are just competing with firms in copper in the copper industry when in reality, they are competing with firms in the aluminum industry, and so the concentration ratio understates the competition in that industry. Also, um, the concentration ratio doesn't include imports. So when we see, you know, and we'll see on the next slide, for example, that tires have a four form concentration ratio of 73%, but that doesn't include um, tires produced by foreign companies and imported here in the US. So, so the top four forms in the United States account for 73% of the total output in the whole tire industry in the US, but if you were to include foreign industries as well, that percentage would be much lower. And also, it doesn't show dominant firms. We touched about this point earlier. This is why we have the Herfindahl Index. The higher the Herfindahl Index is for an industry, then the more market power that, um, some of the firms have 
in those industries. Um, a Herfindahl index of 3,000, for example, versus 1,000 would suggest that the industry with the 3,000 Herfindahl index has the presence of more dominant firms than the industry with a Herfindahl index of just 1,000. Okay, so we can see here, um, these are all oligopolistic industries because the four firm concentration ratio is greater than 40% over here. So primary copper, so the top four firms produce 99% of total output. Um, we have electronic computers, 87 over here. And then breakfast cereals, 80%. And then so on. And you can see the Herfindahl index can differ greatly. So here, for electric light bulbs and tires, okay, the four firm concentration ratio is very similar, but the Herfindahl index is not too similar. So, you know, in the electric light bulb industry, you know, there would be a firm or two that has more market power than in the tire industry. Okay. Oligopolies display strategic behavior. Basically what strategic behavior means is that they will take an action based on the expected reaction of their competitor. So because there's mutual independence, meaning in this case that because there's so few firms that if one firm changes their price, it will usually affect the sales of the other firms. So United, for example, slashing the price of their flight from Houston to New York City will usually affect the sales of you know, Southwest, American Airlines, etc. So usually when, all a, when firms in an oligopolistic structure you know, decide on pricing, they take into account what they expect their competitors to do as well. Um, this can lead for an incentive to collude, and this is when the firms all get together and agree on a price and, you know, set the same price. The problem with collusion is, one, while well, here in the United States it's illegal, but two, there is still an incentive to cheat on that collusive agreement. Okay, we will look at game theory to study um, how oligopolistic firms behave. And we'll start with prisoner's dilemma, which is usually the first game theory example that everyone uses to display game theory. Okay, so Bonnie and Clyde got caught committing a crime. However, the cops don't have enough evidence to put both of them in jail. So they take um, each one separately and give them this deal. Okay, so they tell Clyde, okay, if you confess and Bonnie confesses, you'll each get five years in prison. Okay. However, if you don't confess, but Bonnie tells on you, then you'll get 20 years, and Bonnie will walk away free. Bonnie also gets told the same thing. You know, she gets told if you both confess, you each get five years. However, if you don't confess, but Clyde tells on you, then Clyde will get off free and you'll get 20 years. And what they don't tell them, but isn't the payoff, is that if they both stay silent, they both don't confess, and they each get one year. Okay. So... Each player here, and this is what game theory says, is that they will play their dominant strategy. They will play their strategy that is in their best interest. 
Okay. And so their best interest is to not go to jail. Okay. And so the way they can potentially get out of jail is they confess and hope their partner doesn't confess, hope their partner stays loyal to them. So what game theory will say is that Clyde will confess. Okay. He will play his dominant strategy because what he's hoping is that Bonnie stays silent. That way he can go free and get zero ears. However, Bonnie has the same hopes. Okay. She is hoping that if she confesses, Clyde doesn't confess and that she can potentially also go free. And so her dominant strategy is to confess. And so what they both end up doing is confessing and telling on each other and they each get five years. This is what we call the Nash equilibrium. It's when both players play their dominant strategy and it's named after John Nash who is the founder of game theory. Okay so let's look at another example. So we have rare airs price strategy and uptown airs price strategy as well. Okay they have two options they could price their airfare high or airfare low. Okay so if Uptown Airs price high and Rare Airs price high as well, then they both earn $12 million in profits. Okay. If they both price low, then they both earn $8 million in profits. Okay. But let's say Uptown Air prices high but rare air prices low. Okay. Then Uptown Air will earn six million in profits. Okay. But rare air will earn fifteen million in profits. And then the reverse is true as well. If Uptown Air prices low, they'll earn fifteen million prices if rare air prices high. Okay, so the potential pricing strategy where they can potentially maximize their profit is by pricing low. They can price low, hoping the other one prices high. In this scenario, we're assuming no collusion. Okay, they're not colluding. They're not trying to fix their prices. So what they both end up doing is, you know, they use their dominant strategy of low, since it gives them the best potential of uh, maximizing their profits because they're hoping if they price low, the other airline stays high and they can earn $15 million in profits. But since they both price low, since it's both of their dominant strategies, then the Nash equilibrium is low, low for both of them and they end up with $8 million in profits. All right, and so since, you know, the strategy of both of them having low prices leads to a lower outcome than if they both had high prices, then they will eventually go back to pricing high. Okay, so we're going to look at three different oligopoly models, kink demand curve, collusive pricing, and price leadership. The reason there's different types of models is because oligopolies differ. Um, sometimes it's just two or three firms that make up the oligopoly, and other times it's more like six or seven um, firms that make up the oligopoly. And also, you know, some oligopolies um, have differentiated products and others have standardized products. And also some um, collude and others act independently. You know, oligopolies in the U.S. should act independently. It's illegal to collude. But, for example, um, oil, OPEC, that's an oligopoly and they frequently collude. And also there's complications of interdependence since again, um, what one firm does affects the sales of the other firm. It's difficult for each firm in an oligopolistic structure to estimate their own um, 
revenue data. And so it's hard for them to determine what is their profit maximizing price and output because they can try to set it. But if their rival starts changing their prices, then the other firms have to go back to square one and reevaluate what they're going to do as well. Okay, so the kink demand theory, okay, this is assuming that this is a non-collusive oligopoly. The firms in here do not collude and fix prices. And so there's a lot of uncertainty about how one firm changing their price will cause the other firms to react. So they will model um, potential outcomes. Um, you know, the first outcome they will model is if the rival firms match price reductions, uh, and then they will also model if the other firms ignore price increases. Okay, so let's look, let's just say this is for firm A. Okay. So, firm A is a firm in an oligopolistic industry. Okay. And so they are trying to maximize their profit and they try to pick a price where they know that increasing their price wouldn't increase their profit, but also decreasing their price wouldn't increase their profit either. They're trying to find that sweet spot. So firm A knows that if they increase their price that rivals would ignore the price increase and try to capture c customers from firm A by keeping their prices lower. And firm A also understands that if they were to decrease their prices, then rivals would most likely also decrease their prices. And therefore, there would demand would be much more elastic and they wouldn't gain much more sales from the price decrease because all the rivals also decrease their prices. And so we have the kinked demand curve where the demand curve above a certain price is elastic. So since a price increase would not be matched by rival firms, then consumers would be very sensitive to an increase in price by firm A. Okay, they know they can find a similar, or in the case of a homogeneous oligopoly, the same product for a lower price. So an increase in the price for firm A would not increase total profit because quantity demanded would drop to a large extent. And where a price decrease below the equilibrium price will cause the demand curve to be inelastic. And why would it be inelastic? Because rivals would most likely match the price decrease. And therefore, Firm A doesn't increase their sales enough from a decrease in price to increase their total profits. So the profit maximizing price is right here, P0. This is how they strategically try to plan their profit maximizing output and price using the kink demand curve theory. Okay. So kink demand curve, you know, the, some of the criticisms is how did we even find the profit maximizing price? You know, it doesn't explain that. It just explains why price is inflexible. And prices are not always that rigid, especially in differentiated oligopolies. You know, some people might be willing to pay that increase in price because of certain uh, attributes that that product has that the other rival firms' products don't. And also, a decrease in price can sometimes lead to price wars um, that reduces total profits for all oligopolies. You know, one firm cuts their price, and then the other firm cuts their price, and then the other firms respond by cutting their price even more, and then they retaliate as well, etc. 
Okay, a cartel is a, is a group of firms acting in collusion. You know, they reach an agreement to all charge the same price. And they do this because they want to maximize potential profit between each of them. Let's assume in this case that each firm also has identical cost firms. So they will operate exactly the same way a monopoly operates or a monopolist operates. Okay, they will find their profit maximizing quantity or output by producing where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And then their profit maximizing price go up, hit the demand curve. It's over here. Okay. And we can see here that this price is higher than their average total cost per unit. So they have an economic profit. Okay. So the most famous cartel is OPEC, and this is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. It's 13 oil producing nations. The book says it's 12, but Indonesia recently joined again in 2016, or this year. And they meet frequently and they decide um, how much oil collectively as a whole to produce. And so they produce about 43% of the world's oil. And so they have a significant, uh, you know, influence on price. I mean, they don't control prices fully. You know, different events can also affect oil prices, such as overall global demand. So when China was experiencing um, great economic growth, that shot up the price of oil significantly. Now that China is slowing down a bit, you know, that's also um, causing the world demand for oil to drop. And so oil prices have also dropped because of that. Also, you know, the shale revolution in the United States uh, helped drop oil prices. You know, so much oil was produced here in the U.S. That, that it significantly increased the total output of the world's oil and it dropped oil prices worldwide. Okay, so here we have... Um, this is missing Indonesia because, again, Indonesia just joined this year. But Saudi Arabia, on a daily basis, produces over 9 million barrels of oil. It's the highest nation. Um, Iran is second by 3.5 million. And then Libya is here at the bottom with just under 500,000 barrels, barrels of oil. It can be difficult to collude. Um, first, you know, each firm usually faces different costs. You know, the example I showed earlier, you know, we assume the same cost curves, but that's unrealistic. You know, a firm with higher production costs will want prices to be higher than a firm with lower production costs, for example. And especially in differentiated oligopolies, you know, each firm faces a different demand curve, and so again, it's very hard for them to agree on a price. Also, the number of firms, the more firms there are, the higher it is for there to be cooperation. And it's just more complex because you're trying to get, you know, for example, let's say an oligopoly is six firms, you know, you have to look at six different demand curves, six different cost structures, etc., and six members to agree on something versus if there was just two. Also, there's always an incentive to cheat. You know, we saw in um, some game theory examples that, you know, you could agree on a high price, but one firm may want to lower the price in order to capture the rival's business. Also, recessions encourage cheating as well. If they all agreed on a higher price and sales are lower than firms with higher cost structures will be will have a higher incentive to lower their price and try to capture business at the expense of their rivals. And because usually collusion leads to a handsome economic profit, um, this could attract new entrants to the industry. And there could also be legal obstacles. Um, and this is true for the United States, you know, price fixing collusion 
cartels, they are illegal. And so if the U.S. has evidence that, you know, they are getting together and they're price fixing, then, then the government will prosecute these firms. The third type of oligopoly is a price leadership model. And this is where there's a dominant firm and they initiate a price change and then the other firms change their prices to follow the leader. So firm A is the dominant firm. They increase the price of their product and then firms B, C, D, and E also increase the price of their products. The dominant firm might also set their prices low uh, to prevent entry of new firms. This is called limit pricing. So if the industry itself has high prices, then new firms could come in and charge a lower price and try to capture some business from the existing firms. However, um, the dominant firm could decrease their prices and benefit from economies of scale, whereas a new firm trying uh, to come into the industry has higher startup costs and they will be outpriced by the existing firms. And also this could trigger um, price wars, you know, if a dominant leader lowers their price and then, you know, the other firms follow suit. And if they start capturing more business, then the dominant leader again would decrease their price even further. And then the other firms could also follow suit. And then it goes on until profits run so low or even negative that they increase their prices again. Okay, so oligopolies, just like firms in a monopolistically competitive structure, you know, they will spend a lot of money on advertising and also through product development. As we discussed earlier, because of mutual interdependence, you know, it's very hard for oligopolies to change their prices, you know. Either they increase their prices and their rivals capture the business through lower prices, or if they decrease their prices, then rivals will decrease as well to match. So advertising is a great way to capture business by trying to convince consumers their product is superior. And since most oligopolies earn a positive economic profit, they're able to use their money to extensively advertise their goods. Okay, so there's a lot of people that are critical of advertising, but before we go into the criticisms of advertising, we'll look at some of the positive effects. Um, it can be a low-cost way of giving a consumer information, especially now with the um, explosion of social media. You know, it, it doesn't cost as much now to put your product, for example, on Instagram, where you have millions of followers, or on Facebook, again, you have millions of followers. Um, it also enhances competition, which is always good for the consumer. And um, firms have an incentive to keep developing new products, um, bettering their existing products, or um, lower their prices as well. So this benefits the consumer. And just like I said earlier, you know, it speeds up technological progress because a firm wants to stay ahead of their rivals and so they're spending money on improving their product. And it can also help firms um, achieve economies of scale because if advertising increases their sales, which then would you know, increase their output, then it can reduce average total cost. Okay, so we see here that the largest advertiser in 2011 was Procter and Gamble. They spent 4.9 billion dollars on advertisement. Then we have General Motors with three billion, Verizon two and a half billion, and so on. Below L'Oreal is Walt Disney with 2.1 billion. Okay, some of the negative effects of advertising. You know, critics will say it can be very manipulative. It will try to convince consumers that a certain good is a need and not a want. It tries to alter preference. You know, we don't see water advertised as much as, for example, soda. And so it can manipulate consumers into thinking that, you know, oh, well, Beyonce drinks Pepsi. 
it must be a good product and I'll drink more Pepsi and not as much water, etc. Okay, it doesn't ever tell you the negative effects, for example, of drinking too much Pepsi. So, you know, people say it's very manipulative. Also, um, some products, advertisements have misleading claims and I see this everywhere. And I see it even more now with social media. You know, if you eat um, this type of berry, you'll like all of a sudden lose weight and gain all this energy and just, you know, you'll be amazing. Um, or if you use this type of wrap, again, you'll lose, you know, six inches from your waist overnight, etc. You know, I remember when Skechers had their shape ups, um, they actually recently got sued because the shape ups claims were completely false. Um, there hasn't, no one's been able to prove that walking in shape up shoes actually helps you tone more than regular walking shoes. And also, um, you know, there might be a substitute product that's just as good or even better quality, okay, but consumers don't know about it as much because it's not as advertised and so they end up paying a higher price for a product that's not really any better than another product that's not as heavily advertised. Okay, so you have the world's top 10 brand names based on four criteria. The brand's market share within its category, the brand's world appeal across age groups and nationalities, the loyalty of customers to the brand, and the ability of the brand to stretch to products beyond the original product. And so we have Coca-Cola as number one. Not surprising. I don't think I've ever traveled to a country where there wasn't Coca-Cola. Then we have Apple, IBM, Google, Microsoft, GE, McDonald's, Intel, Samsung, and Toyota. Oligopolies are inefficient for the exact same reasons that monopolistically competitive firms are inefficient as well. They're productively inefficient because price is greater than the minimum average total cost, so they're not minimizing their total cost per unit. And surplus is not maximized because the price is greater than marginal cost and they have excess capacity. Some critics of oligopolies will say that they're less desirable than a pure monopoly, at least with a pure monopoly, you know, they can be regulated by the government, whereas oligopolies, a lot of times they informally price collude, you know, they follow what the other ones do and it leads to a worse outcome for consumers. However, um, there are some counter arguments to this view. The first one is that there's been a lot um, increased foreign competition and foreign competition increases the overall number of firms. It increases um, competition between all these firms and makes it harder to um, collude on prices and it allows for more competitive pricing and an increased choice of products. Also limit pricing. Um, limit pricing you know, is when some oligopolists will try to lower their price to a point where it discourages new entrants and this lower price benefits consumers than if it were a pure monopoly. And also technological advance, um, since again, and with oligopolies, you know, it's more than one firm, they still have to compete with each other. And so they engage heavily in research and development and try to produce a product that is continually superior to their rivals. And that again, benefits uh, customers and society. Okay, let's look at internet oligopolies. Um, you know, the internet became accessible uh, to the general public in the mid-90s, and it's dominated now by Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple. And what's interesting about these firms is that they have almost a monopoly in their specific areas. So, for example, Google dominates search, Facebook dominates social media, some will say Instagram, but um, remember that Facebook owns Instagram now. Amazon, online shopping. Microsoft with operating system, and then Apple, of course, with their tablets, their computers, and their phones. However, you know, they don't just want revenues from their own sectors. They try to compete across their sectors. So, for example, Google 
has started their own social network, their Google circles. Um, they've also, you know, competed with Apple with phones. You know, remember they had the Google phone going. Um, and then we have Microsoft started their own search engine to compete with Google. That was Bing. Amazon has the Kindle, which competes with the iPad by Apple, etc. So since they already, you know, almost pretty much maximize revenues in their own sector, they start competing cross sectors to try to capture the other firm's revenue. All right, this concludes chapter 13.